are we doomed? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> or not, actually. <laughs> uh, in the background, that matched my shirt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, welcome back, everybody. We are here with Ben Chatelain, who is going to give a talk about unit testing. And uh, is there anything you want to say before we start the video? Uh, no, I think there's a, a good intro at the beginning of it. But um, yeah, I'll be around for questions after. Cool. Thanks a lot. And as always, you can ask your questions in the channel of the talk that um, is happening right now. So feel free to ask your questions there and then Ben will answer them at the end. All right, let's get the video started. Hello, and welcome to this session on unit testing with Quick. I'm your host, Fat Blatt. And we're also gonna talk about Nimble. Uh, these are two frameworks that work together and make unit testing a lot more fun than XC test. So all the slides for this talk are available online on GitHub. Uh, if you go to github.com slash fatplat slash unit testing with quick, there's also a sample project in there with unit tests already set up that you can play around with. So in this talk, we're gonna go over BDD, a little bit of theory, uh, which is what these frameworks actually implement, uh, and then the, the syntax for the quick testing framework, as well as Nimble, and then compare that to how XE tests work and you know the pros and cons of that. Uh, you'll see a little star when there's something new and exciting that might be worth checking out quick. And along the way, we'll cover some best practices with unit testing in general. But before we get into that, let me get out of the way here. Uh, who am I? I'm Fat Blatt, otherwise known as Ben Chatelain. I'm a chief iOS developer for Kaiser Permanente. And I work with a team of about 10 developers and we manage a suite of about 30 iOS and Android libraries. So it's inner source across the company. And these libraries are used in our uh, public facing consumer apps as well as our internal enterprise apps. And on the side, I also contribute to open source projects like Quick and Maz, which is a Mac app store uh, command line utility and Objective Git. So really this right here is the problem. Why? something like quick exists. This is jamming a large sentence into a method name and it's constrained by the syntax of the language that's being used, in this case Swift. Reading this is not fun. Test async network call updates label with green check emoji. I mean, the camel casing helps separate it, but there are better ways. So more about quick and nimble. Are there open source libraries that you can use in your project. They can be used independently, but most often people uh, use them together. Quick is BDD style that um, helps define examples and helps you arrange your, your tests and, and that sort of thing. And Nimble is just the matcher framework that ex you express your expectations. So Nimble's more analogous to the XCT assert functions. Uh, it does the same thing as those. So what is BDD? Well, it's one of those fancy acronyms for behavior driven development, but it's more about a mindset where you're not testing code, you're verifying the behavior of an application or some API. It's object oriented in the way that you're describing things and actions like nouns and verbs. And it's similar to a user story. There's a couple of flavors of BDD uh, language and quick and nimble follow in in the spec style, so it's semi-formal. If you've worked with BDD before, you're probably more familiar with Gherkin, which is a more formal syntax used by that Cucumber framework, which is a web testing framework. And it's very, uh, can be very verbose, but it includes all the details around, you know, like an acceptance test and that sort of thing. And we'll see an example of that and, and how they're different. So you're probably familiar with the user story. As a store owner, I want to add items back to inventory when they are returned or exchanged so that I can track inventory. This answers three questions. Who, what, and why? 
Now, Gherkin is, like I said, more verbose. You have a scenario where you, it, this is sort of the name of the, the case, the test case or the behavior, and you have preconditions where that are called out in given, and note that you can combine preconditions with and, and when is kind of like your um, specific case, when this happens, then I expect this behavior. You can have multiple and sections, so they can get complicated, especially if you're specifying every last behavior of your app. So it's a bit wordy. But a spec test is a lot lighter, and this is like a minimal pseudocode for a spec test, where you describe a noun, like inventory, and then you might have some context, an item is returned. So that's kind of like the Gherkin win, and context is optional. You can have zero or many of these contexts if you need multiple conditions, and the it is the, the example. It will increment the item count. That is our behavior. And then expect is the test for that behavior. So if your expectation fails, then the behavior is failing. So Quick and Nimble are really inspired by RSpec. It's a Ruby testing framework which has these same things. You know, describe, ah, where's my hand? Describe, context, and it. And then you see the expect down on this line. Its claim is making TDD productive and fun. So this is a full a quick spec with, with all the different elements just to show you kind of in context. We'll break this down in a bit. The first case has describe an it with no context, but then you can see further down how there's a context with an it. Okay, so describe. Every quick test is going to start with this, and this is really where you're describing your system under test or the thing that will have the behavior. So it describes what you're testing, and it's it's a way to group these examples. It also ends up becoming the prefix for all of the generated test names. And uh, describe is kind of analogous to XC test case, although this is a, a closure-based API. So in general, you'll have one of these where you would have one XC test case. So context is the optional next level down under describe and you're often describing a condition when or if where you want to clarify you know these are the cases where you know i have a green background these are the cases where i have a blue background and if you're expecting different behavior between those then you would assert that or uh, in in each of those different blocks and it, like i said it's optional you don't need context uh, but you can arbitrarily nest these as deep as you want to go and it is the workhorse. This is your example. You're describing the example here. And you want to word these often with a verb as the first word. It calculates. It computes. It has, maybe. My suggestion is that you have only one expectation, one um, expect inside each of these examples. And that really plays into just test maintenance later. When you get started, you may end up adding a lot of expectations, but you should really focus on what is it that you're trying to assert the behavior of, not necessarily what are every single piece of data that could happen. You might want to split those out into separate examples of the data will be this, the data will be bigger than before or something. So anyway, that's just my advice. So like any testing framework, there's ways to do setup and teardown. But one of the awesome things about Quick is that these can be placed at any point in the hierarchy. So before each, pretty obviously, we'll run that code before each thing. But the things that it runs before are at the same scope. And we'll see some examples of these soon. And after each is the same way, but you can also place these wherever you want within that same scope, and they will happen at the right time. You can also have multiples at different, you know, have one at each level if you need to do something before that, that scope, because for that condition, you're going to set it up and so forth. And here's the example of nesting. So we have a describe with a before each, so that first context you see up there went out of water. We're going to have one dolphin created before that context, and that will be shared state through everything below it. Uh, so you may not want to do it exactly like this if you want to 
tear everything down and, and set it up from scratch. But you know, in some cases, you have immutable data that is, is OK to share. But if we go down further, the, inside the next context, there's a before each for everything below that. And so it will uh, set or airborne to true right before and making noise. And then each example inside and making noise will share that same state. But then inside the, the innermost context, uh, that before each is going to run twice in this case, once before it is loud and once be again before it can be heard from 100 miles away. So this vocalization level will get reset uh, before this last one runs. And this is something I don't actually use, but I included it for completeness. If if you need to do something before the entire suite, you know, this would be used for something heavy, like this is setting up a test database. But in my opinion, that's not unit testing, that's more integration testing. So you can do that sort of thing with Quick. Okay, so I'm going to get into a feature, and I need to show the Xcode version so that we can compare and contrast. So Xcode you can disable tests in the test navigator uh, by right clicking on a test and choosing disable test and it shows up grayed out like this but what it's actually doing behind the scenes is it updates the scheme xml file and so if that's a shared scheme then your scheme is going to show up as dirty if you check that in you're you're sharing that disabled test with your team and with ci which you may or may not want that's how that works with shared schemes. But if it's duplicated a scheme and it's not shared, it's just your own personal one, these are easy to forget. Now, looking actually in the scheme editor, this is what it looks like when a test is disabled. And you can re-enable it by checking that box. So they're, they both deal with the same data. It's just easier to use the, the test navigator to enable and disable if you're like temporarily turning off a test. Now, over on the quick side, it has a, a different way of disabling tests. You prefix, in this case, an example, it with an X to mark it as disabled. So the, the good thing about both of these approaches with Xcode and Quick of disabling tests like this instead of renaming it or something is the code still compiles. So if you're refactoring, you know, that code will either get updated as you refactor or uh, show up as an error so you know that it needs to get changed, which is good for the temporary disabling of tests case. Uh, but I actually like this style better because it lives with the code and you know, you're not clicking around with the mouse and that sort of thing. I like to stick on the keyboard. One thing that's weird about Quick is the registration of tests is dynamic. And so disabled tests don't show up in the test navigator, especially if they've never been ran. So that's one, one thing to note, but generally you don't want to leave these tests disabled permanently. This, this should be like a temporary thing for, you know, focusing on just a subset of your unit tests. And this uh, disable feature can go all the way up the chain. Um, at each level, you could disable, you know, an entire context or the entire describe to not test anything. I, I don't want to test that thing. I'm working on something else or it's broken because of something. Uh, so you just prefix any of those with the X and, and they'll all be skipped, kind of like unchecking those boxes in Xcode. Now, the opposite of that is a focus test. And this is something Xcode doesn't offer. If you want to ignore all of your other tests and just focus on one, you can add an F before the it. So fit becomes a focused example. Again, the code still compiles and you know only those focused examples will be run. And this, like the disabled test, goes all the way up. So you could focus on the thing or the context or the it and any combination of these focused things will be the only tests that run in that next cycle. And really this is where the, the reality of working with these two frameworks comes to bear. Up at the top, you've got the XC test uh, that uh, I don't know if you can see, but uh, test dolphin click when the, it's just way too long. Now this does have underscores in the name, which I would encourage as a way to make XC test method names a little more readable. But I just love the way quick with these hierarchies, everything inside the dolphin closure is dolphin examples. The other, the context and the it are all belong to that same thing. It's very easy to see and you don't have these really long lines. And so this becomes a little more apparent when the 
test method name is generated. Each one of those levels, the string inside the describe, context, and it, all get concatenated together. Spaces turn into underscores, and each level break turns into two underscores, so you end up with this perfect sentence. Uh, so it's a method name at runtime, but it's much easier to read in the test navigator, and you're just dealing with normal letters and spaces in your strings. Here's another example of a bunch of different tests where we have the describe is for a view controller, and we have some behaviors attached to that. And these get automatically generated. You can have uppercase, lowercase, that sort of thing. I wouldn't advise putting emoji in these names, even though that's possible. So one caveat that catches people when they first start using Quick is that it's a closure-based API. So you end up with a Xcode uh, telling you to add self um, everywhere. And there's a very simple way to avoid this. Just don't use properties. If you move variables inside the spec function, so they're just a local variable, you don't have to have that syntax. You don't have to add self. So definitely recommended to use local variables. OK, so that's the basics for Quick. Now let's look at Nimble and its assertions or expectations. It's a matcher framework, so it works like some of the fancier frameworks that have more capabilities than XE test, where you can have like contains, uh, operators, and so forth. Actually, both these frameworks work for both Swift and Objective C, but who's using the latter these days? But if you are, then this will work for those. And you can write the quick and nimble stuff in Objective C if you really want. Okay, so. Here's a tour of a whole bunch of Nimble matchers. And there's a lot of operator overloading in Nimble, which is one really nice thing to not have to remember all the syntax. So the basic syntax is expect and your resulting value to equal and then your expectation value, your constant or something like that. And the equals equals operator is overloaded in that case. The reverse of that is the to not method on the nimble matcher and you know that just negates it and uh, not equals is is also overloaded so you don't have to type out the equal in general uh, most of these things you're going to find there is a overloaded operator except in a few cases where it doesn't make sense or there's multiple parameters speaking of which decimal position has multiple parameters because the default like this equals equals is checking is this decimal close to that within a given threshold and the first line is just the explicit syntax and they have overloaded this squiggly equals sign uh, but the tuple syntax is is kind of nice but it isn't labeled like the more verbose one up at the top so you can change your threshold and point one is just the default for that uh, squiggly equals sign. So comparison, you can have be less than, be less than or equal to, be greater than, be greater than or equal to with their corresponding overloaded operators. There's also nullability, where you can have a nullable or optional variable and uh, assert that it is null. Or I expect it to be nil, so I, I want this test to fail if it's if it's non-nil. There's identity operators like be identical to and to not be identical to, meaning the same pointer in memory. You can have substring matching on string contents. Uh, I expect seahorse to contain C. And collection contents can be asserted with uh, the contain operator as well, uh, where you can say this this array does not contain a Mississippi. And type checking. There's two forms of this where you can check if it's a kind of or it's an actual instance of. And a kind of would be one in a hierarchy versus the actual instance of that, that exact class, like an int or a string. XE test versus Nimble uh, is very comparable with, with type safety in Swift now, where you have type coercion. It's going to make sure that we're, we're using the right type right up front. Now, both of these frameworks give you the option of providing a custom failure message. 
the syntax with nimble would be you use the longer form of the to equal or to you know behave uh, syntax with a second parameter of description and XE test you could just add another uh, string parameter to add your string and that looks like like these uh, these examples down below you know where it in nimble it adds an extra line to the log but Xcode it adds it onto the end of the line I would recommend only using these in cases where failure isn't going to be obvious why it fails like this fail because some library didn't load that might not be intuitive right away but most of the time you shouldn't need it especially with quick because if you have only one example or one expectation in your examples then there should be only one reason why that fails so re really just know that this is there but I wouldn't recommend using it unless you need it oh the fun stuff asynchronous tests so this is the simple way to assert that a value is eventually what you expect. So the ocean is clean to eventually be true or truthy. Now there's a, a default threshold on how long this would wait, but essentially Nimble is uh, pulling behind the scenes and failing if that value didn't meet the condition within the time frame. I forget what the the default is, but there's another parameter to eventually where you can change and say, wait for 10 seconds. It might be one second or 0.1 second. But most of the time with async tests, you'll probably find you want to use this, this more verbose syntax, which gives you control a lot like the XE test, uh, XET um, expectation result. You use wait until in nimble to wrap some code a, some asynchronous code but you get a handle to this done closure and you call that to let it know that the the closure finished and the nice thing about that is you can have assertions outside of the the wait until if you want to check some data that was written somewhere else or you can have assertions expectations inside the block if you want to just validate something like this inner closure here uh, it's very flexible you just call done to signal that that work inside the, clo the closure was done so you don't need to wait anymore or nimble doesn't need to wait anymore okay and custom matcher the syntax at the bottom here looks a little hairy but uh, what's nice about this is the fact that it makes the syntax in your tests so much cleaner and this is really useful for uh, swift enums with associated values which are tricky to unwrap you know first you have to be in this case before you can um, assign that to a variable and then you could check that variable but you can put all that boilerplate for unwrapping and getting at the the associated value inside this custom nimble predicate and then b failure is the custom function that you use in your test so up above we have a result object and this is a custom result not a swift 5 result so this result has success and fail and inside failure is an error associated value and uh, we're expecting result to be failure and then we get back the error inside of the the closure and then we can expect that that error is the search failed error so very easy and clean and all of your enum tests can be very nice but this ugly code to unwrap that value and return the predicate result uh, can go live in some extension somewhere but it makes your test really pretty okay on to the caveats or things that are weird about quick so it's easy to forget disabled and focused tests and then your old test suite is only running one or a couple of things and yay everything's working except for all the tests you broke and are not running there's some weirdness about running tests from uh, the editor gutter and the test navigator that i'll show in a minute and basically if you if you try and run a single test from quick a single example or say context it actually ends up running the whole describe block so it, it still runs some of them but it's not as fine-grained control and then uh, clicking on the example itself in the test navigator doesn't navigate you to the code because it's not a method it's a closure function call but if you click on the the spec class it does take you there and again we'll see that due to the way quick reports what tests are 
are even available uh, to Xcode. The list of tests is not uh, available to Xcode until you've run the tests. And this is also true, you'll see some weirdness as if you disable or focus tests, like some of them can disappear and reappear. But it's because of that dynamic nature where Quick is registering the tests at runtime. Quick doesn't support any performance tests, but I don't know, those aren't unit tests in my opinion. Those are more integration, that sort of thing. Um, and Quick is an external dependency. You know, and I don't know what your team's policies are around using open source. Open source does change. They are uh, layered on top of Xcode, so it can break with major versions. But it has a pretty big community, and we fix stuff pretty quickly. But, you know, worth considering. All right, demo time. So, for this, I'm going to have to switch into Jedi mode. Okay, so here we've got Xcode with actually a mix of XE test and quick test, quick spec test. And under example iOS spec, we have all the examples here, but notice how in the test navigator it's not listing them yet. But the XE test ones in blue are showing up. I just need to run the test once and it'll show up the list of active tests. While my simulator is spinning up, uh, you can see that uh, that test example method under XE test is disabled. And boom, there's all the quick tests. They show up as purple. I don't really know why, but anyway, the, uh, the generated method names, like we saw in there, are generated based on these names like this, like basic arithmetic to equal three. And this first one is disabled. So it's not showing up on the side. So if we take out that X, run it again, we'll have another test show up. Oh, that's why I disabled it, because it's broken. OK, no worries. We'll leave that back in there. Someday I'll learn how to do math. So if I want to jump straight to that test, I guess it does figure it out once you have a failure because it, it has a line number or the side. But jump clicking on the other ones is not jumping me around. But if I click on the class, uh, then Xcode actually knows where in the code that is. But compare that to XE test that it knows right where to go. It's not that big of a deal. So similarly, I can focus on this one failing test. Now note that focus and X, you, you can see how the test disappeared when I focused on that one, and I only have that one failing test. The disabling of test doesn't extend across to the XE test, so you can see how the XE tests are still running. You have to disable them through their, their own mechanism, like if I wanted to disable that whole class. Um, I can do it through here. So now I can focus on just this one test, and you know it'll run much faster because I'm not running the whole suite. Okay, so I think that's it for demo. Let me switch back to final slides. So you see this ugliness. Uh, this is what uh, XE test limits you to. You can put underscores in there, but I wanted to show which you You've probably already seen uh, some really ugly test names in your projects. They can be better. Look how beautiful this is. Describe a label. After the network call, it shows a green check emoji. Expect. And there's your green check. This is a bit off topic because it's not about quick, but I did want to call this out because this is a book that just came out recently by John Reed, who blogs over at qualitycoding.org, and he's focused like 99% on iOS unit testing. He does video streams of, you know, TDD, you know, how to get started and that sort of thing. Highly recommended uh, that you check out his blog, but I also highly recommend this book because it has all kinds of strategies for dealing with, you know, view controllers and app delegate and boilerplate stuff to get your, your tests up and running off the ground. It's just XE test, but these strategies are, are excellent and I highly recommend this book.
And always remember, tests that take too long to run end up not being run. Thank you. All righty. Let me do that. All right, remember, if you have any questions, I'm going to read what we've got, but I will add that for any additionals. Um, if you answered these in Slack, I missed it, just say, and we can move on. Um, how well does Quick and Nimble translate to Swift UI projects? Yeah, so on Swift UI, uh, usually I wouldn't uh, look at trying to integrate a unit test all the way up at, at the view level. Uh, maybe if you had some helper functions in your uh, view classes, uh, but generally uh, you wouldn't go that far with a unit test. You would just exercise the actual UI more like a black box or gray box testing using UI, uh, uh, XCUI test automation. Uh, but um, I am curious about that, so I will be looking into that in the future. Uh, might make a good blog post. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Um, something I've been wondering for a while, is there any meaningful difference between describe and context blocks? So technically, in Quick, they're basically the same thing. I've actually never tried just doing a context uh, without describe. Uh, they're really kind of uh, just a container with a, a label. You know, it contains some code and it runs them later, and it ends up concatenating them together. You can actually nest the describes, but the thing is, it's it's more of a semantic thing. Describe calls out the thing you're testing, and context should call out weird cases. So think of it kind of like the the given is your describe, and and your uh, context is like a when, comparing it to Gherkin. Gotcha. All right. Um, da -da -da. Any resources to get started with Quick and Nimble for an existing project? Yeah, so the first place to check out would be the documentation folder in the Quick repository. There's a bunch of different markdown uh, uh, documents in there that cover everything from in configuring Xcode, using dependency managers to include it, uh, as well as uh, setting up uh, the test structure. And uh, there's even a more resources that uh, I think links to other blog posts and that sort of thing. Um, or actually projects that use Quick. So looking at other people's tests right. are probably a great place to look. <laughs> there you go. Well, cool. That looks to be the extent of the questions. There's a ton of applause in Slack. Um, so awesome. Thank you, Ben, for doing this. Um, it so, was a pleasure to have you. I have two things to add. Oh, First, yeah. Sure. One uh, positive thing about COVID that, that relates to this shirt, um, my family's been doing... Uh, you know, movie nights. And so we watched the nine main Star Wars movies and my son got me this shirt for Father's Day. <laughs> so. Very nice. And the Good second thing you. for Tom, I'm not surprised you confused me with Fresner. Been a big fan. <laughs> awesome. His head is probably exploding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you, Ben. We will be back in just under 30...